This is Evan at Evan the Eastend again, and you may be wondering why, in my series about lathes and gear trains, why I'm talking about a phonograph. Well, as you've seen, this phonograph actually is just like a lathe, and it's quite old. It actually belonged to my grandfather and I inherited it, actually inherited two of them, and he had several more that were given away to other kids. I was only about 15 when I got this, so that's uh, oh, about 60 years ago. So this is the more modern of the two models that I have and it's notable for having a two-speed gear train and you can see how the sliding gear changes speed to two minutes or four minutes playing records so there are two different records styles with uh, different pitches on the record itself. It has a clockwork motor so it doesn't require any electricity and uh, once it's cranked up it'll play about two records before it needs rewinding. And we'll look inside and see what the internal mechanism looks like. You can see a spinning governor which controls the speed. And there's a thumb screw on the left hand side which can be used to regulate the speed that it runs to. The lever you can see that comes to the top by Edison logo is used just for turning it on and off. It's a brake really. It has a felt pad on that disc that, uh, that stops it from turning. So I turned that lever to stop it and now you can see the internal parts. Inside you can see the huge spring for the clockwork motor. It's about 40 millimeters wide and it drives the whole mechanism through gears and makes these governor weights spin around. You can see they're mounted on blue springs and the centrifugal force or lack of centripetal force causes the weight to spin out which shortens the length of that rod and pulls the a rotating disc against a pad which prevents it from going any faster and the position of the pad is controlled by the thumb screw. So that's how the speed is perfectly regulated and actually on the carriage there are two marks which are the beginning and end of a two minute record and you time it to see how long it takes to get from one mark to the next and if it's not two minutes you make an adjustment. You can see the first of the marks on a shaft in the top right hand corner of this photo. The information plate underneath indicates this is a model D and um, the patent numbers range from 1897 to 1905. So it must have been made after 1905, and I think this Model D was 1906. You will have noticed that the sound quality in the previous clip was not quite as good without the trumpet on, but it's at the same time quite remarkable how loud and clear it is, even without the trumpet. So now put the trumpet back on, you can see an improvement in sound and uh, tone. And uh, I'd like to explain that the pickup on this has a disc-shaped sapphire uh, as a pickup. And when I first got this, when I was about 15, I had a look at this under a magnifying glass and found it was flattened on one side. And so I was able to turn the disc around and make it run on a fresh part of the sapphire, and I should be able to do that about 10 times. And the advantage of this is that it doesn't damage the disc and you get very little in the way of hissing and crackling on these recordings compared with the later discs. So these are far better quality than the disc recordings. The disc recordings are easier to manufacture and cheaper and ended up taking over the market. You may have noticed that the vibrations picked up by the needle are transmitted through a wire into a diaphragm which is in a plane parallel to the axis of the recording. Whereas the disc gramophones used a pickup with a diaphragm that was in a plane at right angles to the axis of the recording. And the reason is that the depth of the groove varied with the vibrations of sound and the depth of the groove of a phonograph, whereas the gramophone used lateral movement of the needle to record the sound. Now this is an older phonograph which I inherited just a little bit later from my grandfather. And it's interesting because the lead screw is on the same shaft as the record and that's the way early lathes were made as well so it doesn't have a gear train and the thread on the lead screw has to be the same as the thread on the recording you can see here that on this photograph without a, a gear train that the thread is extremely fine and you can barely see it so i've combined the two photographs together one from the newer photograph that has a gear train and the one without and you can see the difference in the pitch on these threads by counting how many turns it does between the two marks and then measuring the distance between the marks as 1 and 9 sixteenths inches. From that I was able to calculate that the pitch of the thread in the upper part of this image is 50 threads per inch. And since the gear ratio of the gear train for a two minute record is 2 to 1, 
the pitch on a two minute record is a hundred threads per inch and the four minute record uses a four to one gear ratio giving 200 threads per inch. Using the gear train allowed Edison to introduce the four minute record and this player that can play either two minutes or four minute records. There is another way that uh, this device resembles a lathe and that is that it's turning between centers. There's a kind of gate on the right hand end of this phonograph which swings in with its center and pops into the middle and clamps into place. And so the whole cylinder and its lead screw are all supported between two centers and the half nut comes down onto the thread when you lower the pickup onto the record. Edison's original prototype also had the lead screw and the recording on the same shaft but instead of having the recording head or playback head moving he has the recording moving in this case. Mary had a little lamb, its feet were quite as slow and everywhere that Mary went the lamb was sure to go. The internal mechanism, a clockwork motor and governor appear much the same as the newer model. The newer model can be distinguished from the old one too by the gold marks around the edge. Uh, the newer one has two lines and the old one only has one with a decoration that's like clump of grass in the corner on the old model. The newest patent number on the older machine is 1898 and the serial number of 69,446 indicates it's only about 14 months after the beginning of production. But uh, this is quite a crude estimate because they think they were making about 2,000 to 7,000 machines a month. You may know that Hero of Alexandra is one of my heroes, let's say, and uh, I have a website called herosteamengine.com. Well, Hero came up with a design for cutting internal threads way back in the first century AD, and he did this by placing pegs in the cylinder here to act as followers to follow the uh, thread they want to copy and using that to drive a cutting tool which is cutting a perfect internal thread. Notice here that we're actually copying the original thread and we can only make a thread that's exactly the same as the original. And that is the basis of all thread cutting except that we have ways of making different thread pitches. Notice that this is quite similar to the second older phonograph that I showed you because the the thread that we are copying and the thread we are producing are both on the same shaft and have to have identical pitches. This is a drawing of a French screw cutting lathe from about 1740 and it, although it had a gear train there was no mention of changing the gears. This drawing of a screw cutting lathe was produced in Germany in the 1480s. It's interesting that the thread they are copying on the right hand side of the machine is a right hand thread and the thread they are producing is drawn as a left hand thread. Inventors often put mistakes like this in their drawings to prevent other people from copying it. This drawing of a cross slide was part of the same drawing and is remarkably similar to modern cross slides with a lead screw driving the tool to the left and a cutting bit which looks somewhat similar to a modern lathe and it is mounted on the bed uh, much the same way as you might expect on a modern lathe too. Many consider Maudsley to be the inventor of modern lathes and this is his drawing from 1797. This design has a number of interesting features from Maudsley in 1800. It has a lead screw running alongside the ax axis of the workpiece and it can be interchanged and you can see in the front of the device there's a set of four interchangeable lead screws. So if you want to change to a different pitch you change the lead screw. But he also had the idea of changing the gear train and there's a whole set of change gears in the foreground. This brings us to 1906 in Germany when this lathe was made. Actually I came across this lathe in a museum in New Zealand. It had been used in a gold mining facility in the early 1900s and is now in the museum and did a little bit of work on, on buffing it up a bit uh, and rearranging the gear train so it was correct. The Magus label says it was made by the Deutsche Maschinen Werkzeug Fabrik in Leipzig. What I like about this lathe is that it is exactly the same as modern lathes in its mechanisms, but everything is exposed so you can see how everything works without the safety guards getting in the way. You can clearly see the lead screw here, 
and in the middle of the picture is a lever with a round knob which is used for engaging the half nuts onto the thread so that the rotating lead screw drives the carriage along the bed at a fixed speed. At the end of the lathe you can clearly see the gear train which is used to control the speed of rotation of the lead screw and thus controls the speed of movement of the carriage along the bed. Even modern lathes have a decal like this explaining the gears or gearbox settings needed to cut a particular thread. Here you can see the spindle that runs right through the head of the lathe with the chuck on the right hand end and the uh, spindle gear on the left hand end that drives the gear train. So they both turn at the same speed normally, although there is a back gear in here that can be engaged to make the chuck rotate more slowly, but this is not used when you're cutting threads. The whole system is driven by these belts, which may be connected to an overhead belt system or driven by a separate motor. Now we can see the similarity to my 1955 English Boxford lathe, which also has a lever on the right hand side for engaging the half nuts for screw cutting. The main difference is the addition of this screw cutting gearbox which was designed by W.P. Norton in about 1886. It allows you to use two selector levers to produce the gear ratio that's required to make the thread that you're planning to make. And actually I'm going to make another video about how the gearbox works and how to work out the gear ratios. Now as an epilogue let's tell you about my grandfather who owned this phonograph. He was Hugh Barrett was my mother's father and he was an engineer working on stationary steam engines which I've made other videos about and his birthday was July 22nd which is exactly the same date as my son's birthday. We think he was the first mobile DJ. He carried his phonograph on the back of his bicycle and took it to parties and that's funny because my son is also a mobile DJ and I've been his roadie and DJ assistant since he was 12. And his birthday is also July 22nd. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Don and Michael's wedding reception. And now he's the owner and director of a circus school. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Night Owl Circus. Yeah!